Welcome to Positive Disintegration, a path to authenticity. Today, Chris and I are talking to Laura Stavanoa about the human voice and what it can tell us about our inner state. We'll be talking about her writing and how she connects her work as a vocal coach with the theory of positive disintegration. We'll be discussing how the human voice can be a litmus test for stress and other processes that are going on in our lives how the voice can relate to overexcitabilities and the dynamisms within the theory, and also how it connects to polyvagal theory. It's a very interesting and different lens with which to view the theory, and we hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Hello listeners and welcome to Positive Disintegration. I'm Emma Nicholson. I'm Dr. Chris Wells. Chris, today's guest is a special one for us because they're involved in the realm of music and voice. That's right. Our guest today is going to bring new dimensions to our understanding of the theory and its application outside of the usual ways that we talk about it, which is going to be really interesting, I think, for our listeners. I think so too. So why don't we bring on our guest? So for our listeners, our guest today is Laura Stavanoa. She's a musician, performer, writer, producer, and coach, has a master's degree in musicology, and is trained as a classical singer. Through her company, Use Your Voice, she offers singers and speakers coaching and counseling about the voice and personal development. Laura is editor-in-chief of the Dutch Positive Disintegration website, writes for Third Factor magazine, and in 2022 published her book, Voice a multifaceted approach to self-growth and vocal empowerment. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thanks, Emma and Chris, for having me. So glad to have you, Laura. It was about a year ago that we wanted to have you on the podcast, and then 2023 was harder than expected. And so we're having you now, but we're so glad to finally meet you because I first was introduced to your work at the 2022 Congress when you submitted a recorded presentation I remember watching the video and being kind of amazed because I had never thought about overexcitability in terms of voice or dynamisms. It just was a whole new perspective. Yeah, I can see that. And um, apparently no one else, for as far as I know, has been working with positive disintegration and the voice. So that is what I spent a great deal of my of the last couple of years doing, um, resulting in indeed the, the video for the, for the Congress and the book that I published. And it's something I work with every day with clients, the voice, and I put it in the, in the perspective of overexcitabilities, which always helps a great deal for people to, yeah, to understand themselves better. That's so cool. But as you know, as a listener, let's jump back now in time for you, because we would love to hear your story of how you discovered the theory and then ended up using it in your work. Yes, the question how I how I got in contact with the theory, right? This is uh, through one of your former podcast hosts, Lotte van Lit. She is like me from the Netherlands. And we accidentally accidentally met on LinkedIn. I was promoting my work, probably some voice workshop. It must have been 2015, something like that. And Lotte, who was not in my contacts, not in my contacts, she saw my my message, my promotion, and she shared it with her audience and sent me a, a personal message like, this is so great, I can really... Uh, it really resonates what you're doing, and um, I really love sharing your work. And something about how she wrote it and what she wrote, it struck me, and I looked her up, her website, which uh, at the time, it still is, it's a lot of complexity.com. And now the website is completely different, but at that time, in 2015, it had this yeah, overload of information about positive disintegration. And I started reading about overexcitabilities and the levels and the dynamisms. And I got so caught up. This, this was something 
that described what I was going through for many years by then. And I never found the right word, the right words for it. And often I could not explain to others what I was going through. And here someone was, yeah, was writing it down. And this led me to the Wikipedia website of positive disintegration. And now one thing led to another. I started working together with Lotte. I took coaching uh, from her. She took coaching from me for singing and and the use of voice. And now we we have a really nice, interesting collaboration. And she's a keynoter for the 2024 Congress yes. this summer. Yes, we're very excited about that. Us too. Yeah. Us too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so interesting. I mean, you just never know when you're going to meet somebody who like changes everything for you. Yeah. And I'm not a fan of all the social media. I'm not on it a lot, but occasionally it's so meaningful the way you meet people from all over the world through that. So I'm, yeah, I'm grateful it is, it's there. Well, before jumping in, I want to talk, I want to share a voice issue that I had six years ago, but before doing that, I want to say that in your book, in your story, I was really struck by how, you know, you had multiple, I would say moments of, I'm not sure exactly even what term I would want to use. I think there was one that I thought to myself, oh, that's like a sudden dynamic insight moment, you know, in like Elizabeth Mika terms. But, and I think that was the one where you finally realized to move away from classical music, you know, that you had to really honor yourself. And after spending, I think you said like half your life trying to fit into classical that you just decided to go your own way. And so in your story in the book, it's really fascinating to see your own process and journey and how that unfolded. And, you know, just, I love in the book too, how you bring the dynamism third factor to life in a way that is accessible to the reader by saying like, you know, it's just a process of this is more myself, this is less myself. And But talk more, if you don't mind, about your own journey through sure. positive disintegration and uh, just to kind of, you know, bring that to life for our listeners who didn't have the chance yet to read your book, probably. Yes. In my book, I, I describe one particular area of my life where I experienced positive disintegration and I, I can say I, ex I experienced it in many other ways but the music part which is my, the part of my career it was so uh, it was so crystal clear to me that as you say the third factor uh, was a moving force that I it was growing and I was not able to deny that that I needed change in my life. I always wanted to be a musician. It's, it was this strong drive to create as a child, but uh, it has, it, ha it had, not anymore so much, but it had an element of wanting to be seen and um, gaining recognition. Yeah, and that element was pretty strong. And also around me, people were like that, and many, many famous artists are like that. And for me, it was it was one big, big thing. Like, okay, you make music, um, you you become great at it, and then you, yeah, people people like you, and you get recognition, and you get to do something that you love. So, isn't that the best life ever? <laughs> That's what I thought when I was young. Um, and I started off doing doing my own songs, so it was is really authentic creativity. But I didn't get an audience for that at the time, not so much. And then I decided, okay, let's go for, for the classical career. I, I'm, I'm a high soprano. I have a, a voice that is, is suitable for classical music. I enjoyed it a lot, especially at the time. So that's the path I, I took. However, um, it's, it's, a rough, it's a rough path. There are many, many talented musicians, and you get also selected by um, by the amount of uh, thickness of your skin. Oh, this is real. 
<laughs> I mean, weird of saying it, but there's not a real, there's no space for sensitivity or vulnerability in that career. And if you are sensitive or vulnerable and uh, prone to stage fright, prone to to uh, critique, then it's um, yeah, it's hard for you, and then you are kind of encouraged not to continue. Well, I got uh, sent away from the from the conservatory in the Netherlands. Then I continued my music education, including uh, performance in voice in the UK. That also didn't work out well, and I left after a year. And I thought, okay, this is this is not what is going to be for me. So I'll focus on an academic study in music, which was fine anyway for me. And I I did that with um, yeah with with great pleasure. And on the side, I started studying voice with with great teachers. And with the right teachers, well, there's some safety, there's space for for some some vulnerability, and I I kind of thrive there. And from one thing led to another. I started giving concerts, performing first in choirs, but then it it led to a solo career even, where I also started working together with with a costume designer, a performance artist herself, and we we made up performances. So it it didn't have the music element, but also something, yeah something from street art and I was crossing boundaries and that that was that was a really great time but I felt constricted in the in the realm of classical music and not because uh, classical music is constricting I, I I won't say that but for me I I had to acknowledge that it was not the right path I was still struggling with stage fright and trying to belong, trying to, to fit in with that world. And I was trying and trying. And the more I tried, the less I, I fit in. Meanwhile, I was exploring my own creativity, started to, to write songs again, which is more pop songs, not even pop songs. It's, it has elements of classical jazz. It's really, it was really my own style. And doing that... I realized, okay, now uh, there, there was a point after after an audition where I was I was clearly s- suited for the role, but some tension in me made me hit a wrong note, and I thought, okay, why am I doing this? I I had to go inside myself and ask myself, okay, is this is this really for the right reasons? I'm doing classical music. Is, and I came to the conclusion that I'm, I was for a great deal doing it to prove myself, to gain recognition, to, yeah, to, to follow the path that I thought was right. But it wasn't in line with also my, my values of creativity, autonomy. I couldn't express it in, in the classical scene. Many others are able to, but for me it wasn't right. So... Then I, I, yeah, I turned away from it. It was tough because I lost a lot of uh, career opportunities. I lost a lot of income, but nevertheless, it was the right choice. And, um, and then I learned that the, this creative instinct, uh, I should pursue it anyway in making music and enjoying what I do, enjoying making music with others even though um, it's not getting me the, um, the success that is often expected when you are a musician. So I'm not after that anymore. I'm sure that a lot of listeners will resonate with what you just described, no matter what their career path is, because I think that some pe- so many people spend their whole lives like trying to fit into a box that they think like that's this is the path I'm supposed to take and never find the courage to go off that path and create their own. Yeah. Chris, I, I was thinking exactly the same thing. There's two things I think that would resonate with anyone like for a lot of workplaces. And you you were talking, Laura, about, you know, the, the tension and the nervousness and the stage fright that it created for you, but I'm sure it creates a lot of tension 
and nervousness for, for other people when this happens. The first one was the fitting in. So feeling like you don't belong where it is that you're working um, or in any group, you know, you, if, when you don't fit in and you don't feel like you belong there, you're obviously going to get one level of, of tension there. But the second one is having that purpose. Um, and there's a bit of bravery that comes when you're living to your purpose and you know why it is that you are there doing the thing that you're doing. Um, and Chris and I talk about, you know, eating the hot dog. So the level of bravery it takes to, to eat the hot dog when, when you know it's full of hooves and miscellaneous meats, but when you've got that hunger or that need, um, you can overcome, you know, your squeamishness about that. Um, and I think you know, there's some lucky people that are in roles where they're confident in their knowledge or their ability um, and they feel like they fit in and then they've got that inner purpose so they know that they're on the path that they want to be and that gives them a level of confidence that maybe, you know, other peers are looking at and going, why can't I be like that person over there? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, I think that's important for, for everybody to hear is that feeling like you belong or that you have earned your place in the workplace, wherever you are, is really important and also having that inner purpose and knowing that you're on that path um, will drive you forward and help you overcome that stuff. Yeah, and what you're saying reminds me of the, we always get t- told, especially when we're young, so if you want to achieve something, you just have to really work hard and you'll get it, right? And yeah, I, I see you nodding like this. It's not like that. Maybe for some people, but I work really, really hard and it doesn't lead to success automatically, and it's not even a lack of talent that, that has to do with it. It is, if, if you really know what, at some point, what you want to do in life, what you're here for, what your values are, then um, it has no point in working hard for something else. It won't work anymore. And I just want to say, I mean, if you think that privilege and opportunity aren't part of success, then you're fooling yourself yes. because they totally are. Well, one thing that really struck me (laughs) this week while I was reading your book is I feel like a dope or I I hate to say that about myself, but I'm reading this book thinking, how can I be a podcaster and not really think about my voice, developing my voice just never occurs to me that this is something I should work on. Maybe I should like warm up my voice or something before we record. I just sit down plug in and and do it. And it made me think that, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should work on my voice. It's just not something that, that I've ever thought of doing, which is just an aside. Like, I just thought that was a funny thing that this is what we do where I'm like, this has become a big part of my life. And yet I don't think about this as like an instrument to develop in myself. And so you've really inspired me to give that some thought. And I actually, when I was, so to prepare for this episode, I was in my journal entries, of course, like, because I had this voice issue that I want to talk about. But I also noticed that, I mean, it's after the Congress last time when I watched your video, it occurred to me that, you know, maybe I should do voice coaching or something, you know, like I just have never, it's not something I thought about until your work. (laughs) I guess that's what I'm trying to convey. Not briefly, but so, yeah. What do you think? Like, I mean, what what do you, do we sound okay? I mean, you're a voice coach and you listen to our podcast, so it must not be terrible. Well, um, the main thing I I, uh, ask people, the the first thing is if they think about um, doing voice coaching or working on their voice, uh, it's often because they get feedback from others. But the most important thing is, what do you think of your voice yourself? Do you feel uncomfortable when you have to listen to to your episodes? Do you, do you feel there is there is some some room for improvement, or are you just really happy the way it is right now? Oh, that's a great question. I don't enjoy listening to myself. I've gotten it's gotten easier compared to when we started, and it was like torture, and I would dread having to listen to the episode. And now. It's okay, but I could do better. I hear myself sometimes being too fast. I know that I often speak too quickly. I don't love the way I sound. 
I don't know how Emma feels about her voice, but and yet I get good feedback from people about my voice. I never thought of my I was never somebody who was like, oh, I have a good voice. I always thought I had a terrible voice until I had a podcast. And like last year at NAGC 2022, multiple people came up to me to say that they love my voice. And I was like, what? Like it just completely shocked me and was a surprise. Well, isn't that wonderful that the image you have of your own voice is often much worse than how listeners perceive it. That is for everyone. Um, and everyone who starts out with podcasting um, goes through the same torture and agony. I'm sure it. I had to get used to listening to my voice, my singing voice, um, when I record it. But I did record a lot in my life, and now I'm completely used to that. On the recording, I sound so different than when I listen to myself in my head. It is a different sound, and there's a reason for it. If you listen to yourself speaking live, um, you don't only hear yourself through your ears, but also through the inner ear. And the inner ear picks up much more resonance from your bones, and that gives your voice a really deep layer. So that's why uh, you probably, when you listen to yourself on a recording, you think, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so thin, I'm so high. Uh, yeah, that's the shock, that you're so much thinner and higher than you sound in your own head. Does that make sense to you? It does, it does. Emma, do you have thoughts on this too? Yeah, I'm sitting here laughing because I'm Aussie. So we all speak through our nose anyway, and I'm resigned to the fact that I sound like shit. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I got used to it quite quickly. And you, you always seem like the odd person out when you're on a podcast and it's always Americans or European people and you're very self-conscious of your voice. But having said that, I've edited this podcast and another podcast for many years and the one thing that I often give myself pats on the back for is I could be a person who sits there and goes at every thought or uh, um, and I don't do that shit <laughs> very often, which makes my life easier when it comes to editing this stuff. So I, I don't know, I just got used to it and as we've spoken about before, Chris, when I started doing YouTube, I was like, fuck it, got to eat the hot dog because there's a purpose behind doing it. So I'm just going to have to suck this up and get on with it. And now I don't even think about it. I'm sure I'm the one that sucks when you're editing with all my filler words and you do I'm always not. all over Shut the up. place, but okay. Well, thanks. We have editing, right? So we can cut out all the filler words. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. But Chris, do you want to share something about your the voice issue that you experienced? I do. It was, yeah, it's interesting to reflect on it now because, so it was November, 2017 when I first wrote it down for the first time. And I wrote, my voice has been kind of messed up. I thought it was kind of lingering from quitting smoking because earlier that year I had visited Michael for the first time. And after struggling for like three years to quit smoking cigarettes, the week before I went to visit him for the first time in Wisconsin, I was able to just quit smoking. One day I just said to myself, I'm studying this theory and I can't smoke anymore. Like it just occurred to me, I have this automatic habit that I'm engaged in that I've been trying to quit and I'm just going to quit today and it's not going to, I'm not going to suffer and I'm just going to put it down. And amazingly, it really worked where I just quit smoking that day and it like, I think knowing that it wasn't going to be the cause of suffering helped it not be the cause of suffering. And that was it. And I just was able to walk away from it. But that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that several months later, when my voice seemed off, I assumed it had something to do with that. Like, it never occurred to me it was tension or anything like that. The first time I wrote it down in my journal was November 17th in March. I was writing again about it and I said, my voice and the way it sort of drops out. And so that's how I was experiencing it. It was like when I was talking, suddenly there were moments where to me, my perception of it was that it was dropping out, that it was weak. And so I wrote that a few times that spring that it felt like it was dropping out. And all, interestingly, I hadn't been to the doctor in years. And so even though I was having this voice issue, I mentioned it to Michael and he said, well, you need to go to the doctor. And I said, well, I haven't been to the doctor in years. I don't have a doctor, like a primary care physician. I hadn't been to the dentist in years. I just wasn't taking care of myself. And so I went to the doctor and got the 
referral to go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And I went. You know, they did the endoscopy to see what my vocal cords look like. And they were, they were okay, but there was tension around them. It was muscle tension dysphonia, I guess. And so I went to speech therapy. And it was so interesting to me to learn that there was this tension around my vocal cords that was causing this problem. And the speech therapist was really helpful. But interestingly, nobody really talked with me. You know, I've been reflecting on this and looking at my notes from that time. But in the speech therapy, it was all around like, here are the exercises you can do that should help. She thought like, maybe I wasn't using my voice enough. But all throughout this time, aside from like the actual issue I was talking about with my actual voice, I kept writing that I needed to use my voice metaphorically. Like I I needed to use my voice in my writing to get the theory out there. And when I look back on that time of like 2017, 2018, it was this huge transition time for me. I mean, I finished my PhD the month that I was going to speech therapy. So this was a time when I was finishing my doctorate after several years of being in the program. I had found the theory, applied it in my life, and now I needed to figure out how to work with it. What was I going to do with it? So I needed to figure out how to use my voice literally and figuratively. And this was the dilemma for me. But also at that time, I had stopped taking medication in 2017. I had stopped treating any kind of disorder, right? And was just me for the first time in my life without any prescriptions. It was so, it was such a strange time for me to go from I'm mentally ill, I'm in the care of a psychiatrist to embracing this theory and trying to be me for the first time in my life. And so it was about, I think, a year later that I wrote for the first time, oh, I guess my voice is okay. Like, I don't know exactly when it seemed better, but uh, I think it only took a couple months after the speech therapy that, you know, I, I stopped noticing that problem where I, that I was describing as like it dropping. Do you think the speech therapy contributed to your voice getting not, maybe not back to normal, but or getting back to a, a new phase, or was it also the your whole process that was more helpful? I think it was my process, but I think the speech therapy did have its uses because she gave me so many helpful things to think of when I'm presenting, even just telling me to take a breath. Like to, you know, she she definitely had some useful feedback for me knowing that I wanted to do more presentations. But no, I it was definitely my process and my own working out of things that, that made it better, for sure. And I mean, I would argue that I didn't even have, I, it took a while to work out where I was going to go. And, you know, just as like, I mean, I was working with Jesse in 2018. I helped her launch Third Factor. Like, then we stopped working together. Like, all of that, was a part of this time when I was trying to find my voice again, like literally and figuratively. So um, it was a really stressful time. I mean, very stressful. And at one time, like I woke up around the time when I, like right before I went to speech therapy, I mean, there was one night where like I woke up and came downstairs in the middle of the night to get a glass of water and like passed out. I mean, I was really like, the t there was a lot of tension, you know, I mean, I was really struggling. My mom had cancer, like there was a lot happening that year. Yeah, this, this, I can relate to this so much from my own experience. When my voice failed me, there were a couple of uh, instance when I was doing classical music where I lost my higher range. The, the range I, <laughs> I needed to use most of the time. And my teachers, they couldn't help me. It, it, was, it just wasn't there. We noticed it wasn't there because of tension, but we couldn't really work it out why and how at the time. And now in retrospect, I know that too much was going on, too much pressure on myself, being in the career that didn't fit, and then the voice becomes a symptom of things that are, that are tough, not going well. A symptom of, of the dynamisms going on in your life. 
the great thing is you can you can work on on that from from both sides. So top down, you have the voice exercises, and uh, just doing voice exercises won't help you hundred percent if you are in a disintegration process. However, it's really great to boost your confidence and know what you can do with breathing and know what you can do with articulation, intonation. And these tools are easy access if you know that they exist in the first place, right? But then, as you described, Chris, you have to do the other work as well, the the bottom-up work, regulating your nervous system, going through the disintegration, acknowledging the dynamisms you go through, um, yeah, developing the third factor. Totally. That's one, like what you just described, like I figured out that I had to, to like tend my own nervous system. So what I, what I learned right after I, uh, I started working with oversight abilities in the voice is that the, is that the autonomic nervous system influences the voice and the voice box in the same way that it influences your heart rate and your breathing and your blood pressure and things like sweating. That was so insightful to, to realize that, okay, this is not something we can, uh, we can work on with positive affirmations. It needs calming down your system through meditation or yoga or whatever you do. And eventually that will also help you in finding your new voice. In your book, when you talk about the overexcitabilities, you have a like a diagram for each one where it's like vulnerability, like an arrow pointing down, and then the strengths of it, you know. And for me, like one of the things that I noticed I don't do anymore that used to be a, I perceived it as a huge problem when I was having a conversation with, I mean, anybody really. So many times when I was talking with Michael, because he, I mean, he just. He's a very exacting kind of person. And so when you're having a conversation with him, you really realize it when you start to try to like go down rabbit holes or when one thought is disrupted and then you want to go to another thought. And so one thing that I used to do with him when we were talking on the phone that I've noticed, well, years now that I don't do anymore is I would stop in the middle of a sentence and go to another sentence and another whole thought. And that's one of the things you had under imaginational I think, right. Yep. That I was like, oh yes, that w- that was me. Um, and so it's really interesting to think about how overexcitability can present as either a strength for you or as um, a vulnerability, how you put it, which I thought was an apt way of, of seeing it and how this can look with all five overexcitabilities. And it was very relatable because I have them all where like, I, not to change the subject, but the fact that you don't have psychomotor, but you have the other four was a surprise to me. Really? Why? I, I mean, it just was like, I don't, I don't know why, but it, I just thought that was interesting because I don't know, I guess I'm not sure why. I, I definitely have seen other people who don't have psychomotor, but do have others. It would surprise me because a couple of things that, you know, the, the questions on like the OE test and that refer to speech patterns. So do you have rapid talking and chattering and, you know, compulsive talking and things like that? They fall generally under the psychomotor bucket. So that's, yeah, I would have expected to see something there too. Do you, do you mean? Just because of that association, I guess. Oh, you, you mean, um, yeah, I, I think my, the, my, my, fast, my fast speech, I would fit under imaginational then. It's just that, that I don't see my uh, my personality as it is now um, or, or even in the past. I don't see myself as an energetic person. I, I can come across as, you know, with, with how, how I talk and how I, how I move when I talk. I can come across as intense, of course. But I, I have a lot of quiet time. I don't have the need to move a lot. I, my energy gets depleted so easily. And I've never really seen myself as someone, someone with psychomotor overexcitability, but maybe you should, um, <laughs> you should convince me otherwise. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe also your training has 
uh, I guess, given you an innate sense of pace and to actually breathe while you're using your voice and and do things that are, you know, small children, you see that sort of rapid chattering and stuff. I, that used to be me when I was a, a kid and every now and then it sneaks up on me but more as an emotional thing. I, I've been on one-on-two calls, phone calls with my dad where he's like, Take a breath and slow down and say that again so I can understand it, please. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But you know, perhaps that's as, as well. Like you say, maybe that's not big on your your overexcitable profile, but also maybe you've had the benefit of the, the training to help control some of those things that some of us struggle with True. occasionally. True, yeah. It, it's thanks to the to the classical training in singing, I from a young age, I'm since a young age, I'm so aware of articulation, of speaking clearly, of that yeah, sentences they have a, they were like musical phrases and silence is important. Yeah. So I've integrated in my life and also in my speech, it's it's an interesting question. Like if I, if I w- didn't turn out as a singer, what my speech would be like then, and if it would be more psychomotor. Yeah, that's that we, we'll never know, but it's an interesting question. I agree. Well, and I think that I mean, of course, they do change over time. I mean, my experience of psychomotor overexcitability now is so different than it was even when I was having that voice issue six years ago, because I've learned how to tend my nervous system. I I have a practice at this point for meditation. I have learned how to change my experience of reality in multiple ways over the past several years. And so... And yet, I still identify as a person who has psychomotor overexcitability, even though I don't feel that inner restlessness anymore. I mean, I know that it's been a part of me for so long that these are things that I don't have like a clear answer on how to um, explain for other people yet, or even integrate in my work or to do research on. There's a lot of things I think that I believe about the theory that come from my own work with it that I haven't put forth yet, or they're still kind of simmering in me or, you know, waiting for the right opportunity to develop. But reading your book made me think about several of them and how, like, there were moments in your book where I thought, well, I don't know if I agree with this. I kind of have to grapple with it. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting because I love that. And I realized when I was reading it that I just haven't had enough experiences of this yet because there aren't enough people writing about the theory to present me with these challenges yet where I have to really wrap my head around it. And one of them is the case with um, your client who, Jamie, I couldn't think of it. Jamie. Yeah. Yeah, Well, because, you know, you present his case and it is a, a great example of somebody who I would give an ADHD diagnosis to probably if I was, you know, evaluating them and hearing more about their story. I think where I land on this is like you, like I identify as ADHD, even though if you watch me in my life now in my work, I don't come across that way Mm -hmm. anymore. Again, because I've learned to like develop myself to a point where it's not so obvious. And yet I know like I know the struggle of of it. You know, I know that I still, I've had to accommodate myself so much in my life that that's why it doesn't look like a struggle anymore. But I think ultimately, I like what you said about Jamie's case, where you are presenting him with this alternative of overexcitability instead of labeling this as ADHD behavior. But I think to me, I had to work all of this out last night before we recorded because I, I don't want to be like, I think you're wrong because I think you're right. I think it is right to say this is the way to look at it. It's a better framework. But what I want to do is say, there's nothing wrong with being ADHD. I want to remove the stigma from that label so that we can say, yes, if you have this, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you just... Your environment is not suiting you right now. You don't have the right conditions for your growth. And maybe you think that there's something wrong with you, but we can present you with this alternative that really is, a, I mean, it really is, in my opinion, a better way to understand it. 
Um, it's less pathologizing, but it's not an either or situation. You know, I think that Jamie probably is ADHD, but you know, when you give somebody a different lens and a different framework, you don't have to have that pathologizing perspective anymore. I, I don't yeah, know if that really makes sense. Definitely. <laughs> I, I totally hear you. Uh, this is one of the passages that I've been, well, spending most time on working with my editor. Like, okay, what is the the state of research on overexcitabilities, ADHD, are they something different? Are they the same? Do they overlap? Correct me if I'm wrong, that this is still developing, right? How we should look at this from a, um, from a scientific perspective. And meanwhile, there's the experience of what they either call ADHD or uh, overexcitabilities. And it's so valuable for me to hear from you, Chris, that you don't find the label working as a stigma for you, that it's, it can also help, of course. It's, yeah, I, and, and if, I, if I do it again, that passage about Jamie and, and ADHD, I would tend to go into the direction that it doesn't really matter. It, it, what, all, all that matters is that you notice you're different from others and you need a perspective and some handles to to create the life that suits you best. And whether that is through ADHD with or without medication or whether that is through learning about Dabrowski and the theory, that's also personal. That's the way I look at it now. I know it's very tricky to try and, and tease out what's what. And I think there was too much emphasis on teasing out the difference as if it's, you know, either or. And I think it's more useful to people who who do identify as ADHD or autistic or whatever the other kind of neurodivergence is to understand that overexcitability is at the root of all of these kinds of neurodivergence. They all experience them. There's not like this is ADHD and this is overexcitability and there's some clear line of demarcation because there's not. No. It's all in the nervous system. And so we're talking about the same thing using different words, but it's the same thing. You it's know, and same. so that yes. let's, let's, it's the let's same thing. And yes. so let's break yeah. the stigma. And, and it's like ADHD is so deeply misunderstood. And I would say the same thing about autism where like with, like not to mention Michael a million times in this episode, but his deep resistance to me being ADHD, he just can't get out of his head. Where's your attention deficit? You don't have a deficit of attention. And I'm like, it's not, it's misunderstood. You know, and so I believe that we can use this theory to help break stigma against these other I, and I'm, like you can't see me listener, but I'm I'm using air quotes for disorder. Like we need to we need to use the theory to liberate. And it's not being used that way if we're saying this is something uh, this is our precious overexcitability. It's not ADHD. You know, like this is why there's so much resistance to the theory in some spaces because you know they see it as elitist or and and for me I'm like well as somebody who was always pathologizing myself and sees this as a theory that's liberating I guess that's where I come down on this that we're not talking about different things we're just using different words yes different words and um with the, with those different words you can go so many ways and it it gives you a perspective which is so much more human than just having a disorder. Yeah, and that and that is yes. That is so wonderful about the theory. It really it's it's about humans and different human beings from from the whole spectrum and there's no normal and abnormal. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. So I know it is a beautiful thing. And to see it applied in this way is so interesting. And like you said, when I asked you about your story, to bring it back to that, like, of course, there's so many different dimensions of us. And so, you know, we can talk about our disintegrations in terms of voice, but that doesn't mean we're not also having them in, you know, these other areas of our lives, which leads me to something I wanted to ask you about the dynamisms, because I wondered, and I realized, of course, anytime we're writing, we have limited space and we can't go into the weeds about everything. 
much as I would always love to go into the weeds. But can you talk to us about how this is, again, from my own research, do you see unilevel and multilevel dynamisms present in the same people ever where somebody may have a bit of ambivalence, but they're also, you know, you, you know, guilt and shame are also there or whatever. Can you talk about that? Yes, definitely. I'm so glad you bring this up. Um, I don't see unilevel and multilevel as this um, great epiphany, right? The, the blue pill, red pill. <laughs> I remember this from from like one of your episodes, uh, I think one with Michael, we were talking about that. And these worlds of of development, they can coexist. I truly believe that. Especially if I look at the people who come to see me, they they have, um, all, all of them, they have some feelings of inferiority towards themselves and it's not inferior towards themselves what others think, but really towards themselves and, uh, and their voices. And meanwhile, they, they come with much ambivalence. And it really jumps from, from moments of clarity to moments where, where they sometimes uh, avoid getting back in touch with me and trying to get back to, to how things were, trying to, to delete what they've learned about themselves. And... It's, it's really going back and forth from, um, from unilevel to, to multilevel. And I, I firmly believe that you can experience different levels on different aspects of your life. So in work, you might be organized, multilevel, things, things are stable. And then in your private life with your marriage and your children, you behave so unilevel. We, we see that a lot, right? Or the other way around. What do you think? I just was listening to you and thinking that it sounds, it's, you're like a therapist, not just a voice coach where you're. Yeah, I, I am. In fact, <laughs> I'm a therapist, um, but I'm, I'm not officially a therapist. It's just that usually the sessions, they turn out to be like therapy sessions. Not, not with everyone, but yeah, it is the way it can go. Well, and it's so common when you do clinical work to have people be ambivalent. And even though they want to get well or do better, they struggle to work with you because you're challenging them. And so it does create this like push-pull experience. Yeah. You, you're familiar with that too? The push and pull? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm just going to do a bit of a connect the dot here because all this stuff that I've been hearing, I'm not surprised that what Laura does gets into the realm of therapy because if we're talking about the voice being connected to the nervous system, overexcitability is being, you know, a heightened nervous system, and we're talking about emotions which we know affect our voice. We, we know that when we get nervous, our voice changes. We know that when we get upset or angry our, or excited, our voice changes, you know, whether or not you're overexcitable or not. And we know about the theory that a lot of the dynamisms are emotions or conflict between emotions. So am I surprised that all this stuff is being seen by someone who is looking at the voice, which seems to be like a litmus test or almost the canary in the cage that, that's telling us that there's something else that's going on with the person, you know, and their emotional path and even what we were talking about right at the beginning about purpose and fitting in like people will know that when they speak to something that they're passionate about that they truly believe in you know they speak a lot differently than when they're telling lies or they're saying something that they're not sure about or they're trying to sugarcoat something you know um so when we are in touch with our our values and we feel good about things we speak a lot differently and we know this because we're not trying to force it and we're not trying to overthink it. So am I surprised that Laura is seeing all this shit manifest through someone's voice? It's like one looking at one little like aspect of a person, but being able to see how that's showing what's going on underneath the surface. Yeah, that tip of the iceberg, right? And I, when I started doing this work, with the voice so it starts with giving singing lessons that's what you do as a singer at some point you're going to teach others how to sing and by doing that noticing all of 
that what you just mentioned, Emma, realizing that, oh, wow, um, we're, I'm not just working with voice, I'm working with this whole person and its development and, its, and their emotions. And yeah, you, you can choose to just work on the surface with the tip of the iceberg and work on the voice. But I got so carried away of what was below the surface that, yeah, that's what I devoted time and, and study to is, is to, to get to know how that works. I really wanted to understand how and why does the voice reflect it? Because um, we, we get a lot of, yeah, the, the, the voice is, is, the, is like the, the mirror of the soul or what, what is it, how they say it? Like the eyes, it mirrors the, the personality, the soul. But why is that? It's, it's, it's not some thera, uh, do, you, do you know what I'm, I want to say here? <laughs> Esoteric, sacred. Uh, yes, etheric or um, some vague spiritual thing. Now, it, it has a real connection with, with the body, nervous system, and, and psychology. And when I found out about that, I was hooked, and I wanted to get everything. I wanted to know everything about it. Which is precisely why you asked Chris. <laughs> Do you think it was the voice therapy that helped or was it your own process that made the major difference? Mm -hmm. And I guess for you as a voice coach, if you really want to relax someone and get their voice into a good place, some of it's going to be working at, you know, what's between their ears. Yes. Almost like nine out of ten people, we need to look at something else rather than the voice occasionally it's just learning to slow down pronunciation better it, it this is the, the situation where people are totally fine they're not in any uh, conflict at the moment but they had parents who spoke in a certain way and they copied that and they they never realized that they just copied their their parents mumbling or soft voice and then when when we go through that and I make them aware of that, it solves the problem. But it's a minority. And the nine out of ten other people, they need, they need to become aware of what is what's beneath the surface, how the voice is connected to all of that, nervous system, psychology. And then it's, for me, then it gets interesting. Then I get to work with the human being and their life. That's, that's what I love about it. That's so cool. And it's like, it, that's not the experience I had with speech therapy here. And of course, it's different than going to a voice coach, right? Like, so I, that was like medical model, going to someone who, you know, the insurance is mostly paying for. And, um, but like, she never was like, what's going on in your life? It was all about like, here are these exercises I can offer you. You know, there wasn't enough time even in those sessions to go into all of the like drama of my life at that moment, <laughs> which again, I was like about to defend my dissertation and had the Congress coming up and another conference. And there was so much stress at that time that like, whoa, I don't know how we could have even gotten into all of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's how it is. That That's the reality, right? It is. Uh, of course. I mean, that's so like, uh, that's often how it is, though. I mean, even when you do clinical work, it's it's interesting because people don't always come to you with the main conflict because they're not able to even always be aware of it, that it is the conflict. <laughs> so, yeah. I want to react to what you say that most of the time, um, when people come to me with, oh, this and this with my voice, this and that, uh, we are searching for the first sessions to, okay, what's the question that lies below? Yeah, so that's what, what's in the first sessions. I'm always trying to get access to the main issue because they often don't mention that. They're not aware of it in the first phone call. Yeah, it's, it, it's so complex the way that these things play out. And, you know, it's, it's it's tough because when you're working with someone first, you have to like build rapport and they have to trust you. I mean, you don't meet some stranger and like unload onto them. Although of course that does happen too, but I mean that not necessarily like with someone you're paying to work with. So people don't have access to a professional to go to. I guess they could use some of the staff in your book um, that you've spoken about or and just their own observation of their voice, just record themselves 
um, like having done pod- podcasting and having to listen to my own voice, I've noticed things myself, even small stuff like when I am relaxed, my accent gets thicker. The subject matter of what I'm talking about affects how my voice is. And I, but I can just hear that from my own observation. So I guess, Laura, it's probably helpful that even if people can't get access to someone to help them dig under the surface, people could probably try and do this themselves just by recording themselves and listening to it back and seeing what they could maybe pick out. Yes, there is a lot you can do um, with your voice also indirectly, without having to see a speech therapist or a voice coach. And that is doing doing the developmental work, isn't it? It's moving through difficult phases in your life and trying to get things on track, making brave decisions about new paths. That is a start, and everybody can do that. And there's fortunately so much literature to, to help people with uh, with that and if you combine that with seeing a speech therapist especially when it's paid by insurance that's always a good thing then you can combine it but then you're not focusing on the on the speech as the main issue that that needs solving but then you see it as okay i can i can get some some handles some tips and tricks for my voice but it will only serve my voice if I also do my inner work. Yeah, luckily I was doing that anyway when I went to the speech therapist. I mean, that was the the water I was swimming in. I just, I saw it as I happened to have this speech issue. Like, it's just funny to me in retrospect that I didn't connect it with the tension in my life at the time, you know, until later when I was like reflecting back on it. Look at your journal, look at your journal and listen to yourself back and use the two in tandem rather than seeing them as two separate things. Yeah, do both the journaling, recording yourself, and and reviewing your, um, evaluating your recordings. And do that for a year and see what changes. Good advice. So yes, let's just briefly, I just want to mention, because I feel like we've never had a guest where we talked about polyvagal theory at all. And yet I know that this is really interesting to people because of, I mean, we're all like, again, we're talking about the nervous system, different words, different ways. The idea of safety as being necessary for us to thrive, psychological safety, we realize now that children can't learn at school when they don't feel safe in their environment. We know how much this is critical to our ability to thrive in in so many ways. You know, I mean, we could go deeply down this rabbit hole if we wanted to, but I wonder if you could just say a little bit about this for us without me trying to come up with like a better question because <laughs> I'm not sure I have one, <laughs> yeah. but I want to go into yeah. it a bit. And connect it to the voice or in general? To the voice, to the theory, even to, if you can connect it with the theory of positive disintegration a bit, that would be great oh, too, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. No, sure. I, I, uh, I have made that connection um, myself a lot while learning about the polyvagal theory, which is the, the science about the autonomic nervous system. And while I learned about it, I, it got me flashbacks to, to Dabrowski's work all the time because he says that, especially in, the, in, the, in, this, in his book, uh, Psychoneurosis is Not an Illness, he talks all the time about how, how everything that we call disorders now is a sign of a, of a dysregulated nervous system. And when I um, took uh, classes with Deb Dana, who, who put the polyvagal theory into the clinic, into a clinical practice. She said something similar, like everything we experience as diseases, disorders are because of this regulated nervous system. And I, in, I wanted to connect the two. And what, what I did in the book is, of, of course, you have the overexcitabilities. They are, they are signs of, uh, of intensity. And I would say now that overexcitabilities in, vulner- in, in vulnerability are a sign of a dysregulated nervous system or when you, when you don't feel safe. And safety is a, it's a big word, but uh, it's good to mention that 
you can also feel uh, or your nervous system detects signs of danger even when you are on the surface completely fine but maybe there's someone in the room you don't really feel connected to and this person makes you a bit nervous that's for your system that's already a sign of danger and then you don't feel 100% safe now whenever you do feel 100% safe your system is able to yeah to switch completely to something called uh, social engagement yes that's what it's called social engagement and this is this is where true connection can take place where you can can feel empathy and compassion for others if you don't feel safe that is uh, that's quite hard i suppose and from the safety you can still be intense you can still uh, express overexcitability but then it's not like you are irritated or anxious but then it's more you're you're focused you're energetic uh, you get things done you're creative I, I really see this as as a valuable connection and um, I can say so much more about it but I don't know how how much we we should dive into it is this is this kind of what what you wanted to know um, it is. Well, it is funny to me because I, I think it was like in 2020 at some point, I participated in a polyvagal theory study group, which was really interesting to me because I had, of course, been in like Dabrowski's study group before. And so I had the same experience where once I started learning about polyvagal theory, ping, 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 like all the connections were there for me too. And it's super interesting. And I would love to, to do more research, you know, to bring the theory and polyvagal theory together to see where they connect, because I think that that's what it's going to take in order to move forward with the theory of positive disintegration. We have to look at all of the the modern connections to see what fits, what doesn't fit. There's a lot of work to do to bring positive disintegration out of where it was and to resituate it, position it now in the 21st century as as a valid frame and alternative perspective, we can't just keep pointing back to 1972 to what Dabrowski said all the time. We have to talk about it in our modern terms. And one of the ways to do that is to see what other multi what Emma's always talking about multiple perspectives, right? Like that's like a catchphrase at this point on the podcast. At least that's how it feels to me. This is something we have to do. And so I was really happy to see that in your book, to see the connections that you made. And I'm not sure we have a lot of time to go into it now, but we could have you come back and do probably a whole episode just about that. But uh, I'd love to hear that you you had the same experience that when you learned about polyvagal theory, it's like, okay, we should bring this together. That's It was yeah, it's exactly my thought. And I'd love to contribute in, in any way to... Um, it, I, I think it will give positive disintegration also more... Uh, urgency in that sense it it, it it makes it more contemporary because polyvagal theory is hot it's everywhere and if we can connect it to overexcitability and dynamisms um yeah we really have something here i agree i think that's really important work to be done and so anybody who's listening and wants to be a part of this i don't know at some point i feel like i need to make a form where people can go in and be like yes i have expertise in this area and would like to help and can like submit their information to us although you could always just email us too so no it's it's great it's really great yeah so it's been so, so great to have to, you to be on your podcast that i'm a big fan of so but we appreciate that and it's been wonderful having you yes thank you so much for coming on and thank you to you as well chris always a pleasure thank you it is yeah. always a pleasure and thank you to our listeners we always appreciate you too that's right we do Continue your path to authenticity through the links in the show notes. Subscribe to our Substack newsletter for stacks of cool things delivered straight to your inbox. Explore the Dabrowski Center, email us, or join us on social media. And don't forget to show your love by liking, subscribing, grabbing some positive disintegration merch, or leaving us a rating or review on your podcast platform.